Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for the panel discussion for Stay Silent, Drift Deep, featuring four featured artists, Stephen West, Margaret McDermott, Ava Marguerite, and Shailen Trednick. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge its virus facility located in Ottawa is on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here dates back to time immemorial. We honor their long history of welcoming many nations to this beautiful territory and uphold and uplift the voices and values of our host nation. We want to acknowledge the historical and oppression of lands, cultures, and of the original peoples in what we now know as Canada. And we fervently believe the arts contribute to the healing and decolonizing journey we all share together. We're going to hear a little bit from each artist and then we're going to open up into a bit of a round table discussion. I'm gonna ask that everyone stay muted um, to ask questions. We'll have some, some things going on in the chat. Um, and if you have to leave at any time, this will be on YouTube. So we'll look forward to uh, re-listening or hearing from that. If you're on YouTube now, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Darren. I am the uh, Spau PNP teacher. Uh, I am also the artist residency coordinator and I am the gallery manager working in a curatorial role. And it's in this role that I get to see and watch the artists projects grow and change and evolve. I get to see them uh, propose exhibitions and kind of work within the space. I get to see uh, partnerships happen. I get to see grants and, and I get to see uh, all sorts of kind of community building processes in advance. So this is my favorite time when I get to listen uh, and reflect on the work uh, itself after the kind of uh, big flurry of, of creative activity and production. Stay Silent, Drift Deep is a meditation on how one navigates through times of trauma. Each of the four artists sift the dark wells of their internal structures, probing for a way to examine and resolve their individual dilemmas. Is there peace and solitude? Can mental health be mapped? Where are the spaces for self-discovery and how deep does this grace go? The exhibition asks viewers to untether their expectations and fall into the dark turbulence of contemporary lived experience. This exhibition is the culmination of a six month artist residency at the Spa Center, which captured an incubation of intense periods of research, self-discovery, mentorship, boundary expansion within their practices. Throughout the process, the artists navigated the challenges of personal struggles, pandemic restrictions, and the difficulty of staying true to their individual visions. The resulting work presents a dialogue of self-reflection, of acceptance, and perhaps even release. Margot, why don't you start us off? Tell me a little bit about your project, some of the core themes, the challenges, some of the successes. Uh, feel free to share your screen and to illustrate any images. So thanks, Darren. Um, and it's nice to meet everyone, you, everyone virtually. I've met a few of you um, in previous years uh, at SPOW. So my project was called the Outdoor Rink. Now, the name actually came from what people call neighborhood rinks in Ottawa. They call them the outdoor rinks or the ODR, um, which is very Canadian because I guess we also have inside rinks. So the name came actually from uh, people who actually use those rinks. So what this project about is, is about is um, about the neighborhood rinks in Ottawa. There are 270 of them dotted right across the city in various different parks. We have the most outdoor community rinks in the country. Um, and I wanted to take a look at these rinks uh, and capture their beauty, but also reflect how those rinks actually uh, help people get through the winter. And in particular, how they help people get through last winter, which was our first full pandemic winter. So the idea actually came from uh, a project I did when I was a student at SPAL uh, called minus 20. And I actually had taken a photo of an outdoor rink near my house where I used to walk all the time. And I used to think how beautiful this rink was at night. And our direct, the director of education for Spout, Michael Tardioli said, why don't you do a series on rinks? So the original idea was to do sort of a grid, a grid of rinks. So a whole bunch of different rinks shot in the same way in a grid like uh, Burned and Hella Becker did a, a typology of rinks. But I decided that that was too uh, restrictive and uh, decided to expand it to include not just the rinks, but the people who look after them, because that's what this is about, and the people who use them, who skate on them, obviously. So that's kind of where the, the project got going. So uh, what I did was I got a list of about 30 rinks from the city of Ottawa. The head of the director of Rec recreation there, Paul Dupuis, provided me with a, link, a sort of a list of rinks sort of a cross-section of rinks in, 
in suburban areas, inner city Ottawa, a sort of a, a wide cross section that I could take a look at. And in the fall of last, of um, I guess it was, yes, it was last year, um, I visited all 30 rinks uh, over a period of a couple of weeks and took notes of each one and looked at, is this gonna be realistic? Is this gonna be a nice rink to shoot? Which is surprising because some look nice in the fall, but don't look so great in the winter and the other way around. So when it started to finally get cold, um, I did a series of, I started to actually shoot these, the photos of the rinks. And the whole theme of this for me was about community because the way these rinks are looked after is the city provides the boards and the electricity, but it's the people that actually look after them. They go out um, after big storms and shovel and a snow blow all the snow off these, these rinks so that people can, can use them. And they do it really late at night, so nine to 11, often into the middle of the night. Um, some people actually get up at 5.30 in the morning, believe it or not, and, and actually flood and look after rinks that way. So uh, I wanted to capture the work that these people actually do. Um, and it's a unique system in, in Canada, actually. Uh, rinks are maintained in other ways across the country, but Ottawa has a really, a really good system that actually works pretty well. So what I did was um, I sort of went out to each rink um, and took photos at night. Um, and I wanted to take it at night because the rinks are, I think, most atmospheric and beautiful at night. They're these sort of these warm pools of, of light surrounded by darkness. Um, and that took quite a while. Um, it, often I had to visit rinks uh, three or four times to get the shots I needed as a, uh, and take the original sort of test shots. Um, and then I went back and took photos of people cleaning the rink. So I'd have to wait for a big storm, um, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and then I went back again and took photos of people actually using the rinks. And so I, did, I had to sort of walk this fine line between sort of uh, Norman Rockwell, all happy photos, which, you know, doesn't work for Spau. Um, and, also sort of a more critical look, a more critical approach photographically of what these rinks look like, their structure um, and the dynamic in the rink. So it was, it was some photos got tossed out because they were too cheery. Um, some photos got tossed out because they were too, um, they just didn't evoke the feeling from the rink. So that was quite a process. Um, so the whole thing was, uh, a long, it was much longer and much harder than I expected it to be, which get, leads me to some of the, the challenges of shooting at night in the winter, in the dark. Uh, and Daria, I know you asked me to talk about some of the challenges. So the biggest challenge, it wasn't actually the cold. And it even really wasn't the dark because of course you can put your camera on a tripod and you can, you know, open up the uh, app, you know, you can open up for half a second if you need. The, the challenge was getting to a place where you could actually see the ice, you could actually see the rinks, because if you walk into a park, you just see boards. So you have to get above the rink. So the most useful piece of equipment I had, besides the camera and the lens, was a stepladder from Walmart, which I carried to all of the rinks, to all 25 rinks at night. And um, I would put the stepladder on picnic tables, on piles of snow. I would even climb up on, you know, the uh, play structures they have in these city parks. I would bring the ladder and climb up on top of the uh, play structures, which is a bit dodgy, but anyway, um, all of which is just to get above the ice and to be able to see both the rinks, the lights, and, and, the, uh, and the ice itself. So I'm gonna just actually share my screen with you and show you what I, what I actually got. So this is, um, this is just a sort of a sample of some of the, the photos that I, that I took. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, this is, um, this one here is actually in Stittsville in the town where I grew up, um, taken in a, um, an actual snowstorm, which you can sort of see. Um, this was an extremely cold night which you can't really see, but this is a, uh, one of the other photos that I took. Um, this is in Lower Town. This is an interesting rink because it was set up by the Ottawa Senators, the hockey team, 
who um, actually built the rink so that it could be used year round. And it, it attracts people from across the city and Gatineau um, because it's such, a, it's such a good ice surface. This is uh, in Canada. Um, and the challenge here was to get both the bright rink and the shadows of the trees surrounding it. This one was, is actually one of my favorites. Um, it was taken, as you can see, in a snowstorm, a really bad snowstorm. What a few last winter, which was one of the other challenges. There wasn't enough bad weather to take proper, to take proper shots, in my opinion, because as you know, bad weather makes very good photos. But this was unfortunately one of the uh, good photo days. This is uh, Owl Park in, uh, near Hunt Club. So you can see there's quite a cross section of locations in the city. This is, uh, this is a Tanglewood, which is a really popular uh, rink in uh, Nepean. And I, I was struck by the Western sky. So I went back a couple of times to try and get um, the rink before it got completely dark to capture the, the, the light. This is actually one of two rinks that I got in Chelsea, in uh, West Quebec. And why West Quebec, you ask? Because they have beautiful rinks. So there you go. Um, I just took them because I like the look of them. Um, and these are volunteers who actually look after a rink which is built on, a, on an outdoor pond. This was taken just after a big snowstorm as well. And you can see it's, it's part of the pandemic. A lot of the volunteers had to, wear, had to wear masks and people using the rinks were also required to use masks. Again, this is some of the conditions that the volunteers live through all winter. It's tough. This is the lower town rink that I showed you before, hugely popular uh, among people who live in the area. This is near my house uh, and this is one of the few, one of the four snowstorms last year. And this is the last shot I actually took in March. Uh, of a son and his, uh, a man and his son, and the, uh, obviously the photo struck me because of of the mirror image of the little boy and his dad uh, on the rink. This again is some of the conditions that the volunteers live through. Um, a lot of flooding, and this was uh, taken. Actually, my first photo that I took in the project was this one. Um, it was after Christmas in Mont Saint Marie and somebody, the little boy got a breakaway and I managed to capture it, fortunately. So the thing about this project was, I actually learned a lot about what makes the city tick. And, and, and I actually, I grew up in Ottawa, I've lived many places, but I grew up in Ottawa. I was totally struck by the fact that we have this huge network of beautiful parks. And each of the rinks reflects the personality of the parks. It just, it just happens. Um, there's actually one place that I want to take photos of this winter where they have outdoor curling competitions. You know, very Canadian. They didn't do it last year because of the pandemic. But each one has this personality. And that was what I tried to capture. And finally, I've been asked to talk about successes and things I'm happy about. Um, the city of Ottawa, uh, we sort of collaborated on this project a little bit. And in the end, they bought 350 copies of the book that I produced. I produced a 70 page book um, and they gave them to the volunteers to thank them for all their work because um, they normally have a big party for them every year and they couldn't because of the pandemic. So instead they gave them my book. So I was really pleased about that. And I learned a lot about shooting in the cold and in the dark. So it was a success, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I really like that um, you know this 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 project uh, exists in multiple iterations. On the wall behind me, we have these dark, we have these turbulent, these high contrast kind of images of the rinks. And like you said, each one has its own personality, and each one's kind of um, got this great kind of mysterious or kind of solitude or very kind of peaceful quality to them. And then you have this whole other side of all the people that work towards building that. And I think that's uh, really interesting to see how an exhibition versus the book that's produced can lead to different experiences depending on uh, how you approach it and how you do it. So um, thank you so much for sharing. I'll have some questions at the end, uh, but we're gonna move on. Uh, Ava, can you tell me a little bit about your project and how it's grown and how it's changed and some challenges and successes? Yeah. <laughs> um... Yeah, um, so I'm just going to start with a little bit of information about myself. So my name is Ava Marguerite. I'm a multidisciplinary neurodiverse artist based in Ottawa. 
I have a Bachelor's of Fine Art Photography from OCAD University and a diploma from School of the Photographic Arts, Ottawa. Spout. My practice started predominantly as a lens-based practice. The camera has allowed me to organize and process lived experiences. I am drawn to this medium because I am able to create my own visual language that helps me connect with others. I also work in illustration, painting, printmaking, and writing. In the past year, I was awarded the Youth and Culture Pilot Program from the City of Ottawa to complete my book One Mile. I was the runner up at the Toronto Outdoor Art Fair for Best Photographer. My work was collected by the City of Ottawa for their direct purchase program. And most recently, I was awarded runner up for the 17th edition of the Julia Margaret Cameron Award in the category Self Portrait Woman Seen by Women. So, One Mile follows two previously completed, completed projects. The Moss at Home, which examines the immediate aftermath of a turbulent relationship and the separation of my parents and romantics, which was the time I spent processing those events. As an individual who struggles with writing and expressing my inner narrative, this project became a way to express heavy subjects without using words. Gravitating towards photographing difficult periods of life, this project represents both internal and ex external obstacles. Um, so I'm just, I have some photographs that accompany these images. Uh, six months ago, I thought One Mile was purely about my relationship with my hometown, my family, and how the issues of control played out in those relationships. While those themes are still relevant, they have become much more specific and intricate, like a spider web. I find fascination in the complexity of existence. Every event and proceeding my life has led up to this moment. At the core of my series is my relationship with my sister, her bond with our dad, and how that differed from mine. Being neurodiverse is a driving force behind my practice. I struggle with reading and writing, however, excel at visual learning and use that as a tool to process and understand. I explore concepts like the temporary ch change, meaning in the ordinary and external factors or history that impact us as individuals. One Mile feature its, features intimate moments, portraits, self-portraits, still life, architecture, and landscapes photographed on medium format color film. Through the lens of poetics, carefully curated light and soft color palette, I attempt to honor my own story and the sensitivity around those living unknowingly with untreated trauma. The pandemic provided an opportunity where my, where my mom, sister, and myself lived in the same home. I wasn't close with my sister. I often felt criticized by her. She would comment on my appearance and approach the world creating a sense of unease within myself and a barrier between us. When we were kids, my sister and our father were close. They were a team and they were unkind to my mother and me. I feared my dad. He was physical and verbally abusive with me. Because they were a team, my younger sister became my second at home bully. I found solace in books, the natural world, and eventually photography. Over the past year, my sister and I became close. She let me into her life and for the first time since I was young, we were close. In recent years, my dad had begun to treat her like my mother and I. With time, the illusion of who she what of who she thought he was faded. Over a year, I watched my sister, a force of power, confidence, and beauty, crumble. She became ill. My life and my mother started to revolve more and more around her illness. My family's lives had always revolved around my dad's moods. He grew up with an abusive alcoholic father. I believe he still hasn't to this day processed those events. He, is, he was highly explosive, and so we made ourselves small to avoid making him angry. When my sister became ill, my mother and I quickly fell back into the pattern of taking care of someone else's needs before our own. I didn't mind taking care of her, but she wasn't eating and she became ghostly thin. My heart ached, but I was fascinated with the changes her body took posting different undistinguishable rashes and how her clothes draped off of her like she was a supermodel. Beauty enmeshed with the grotesque. I never noticed how ill she was because I built her up in my head to be larger than life, as if nothing could touch her. I used to imagine boys falling at her feet as she walked by, living in another world I could never inhabit. I was broken, 
and she was the unbreakable. While my heart ached for her illness, the harm child in me reveled in her suffering. It brings me such shame to admit that, but it's what makes me human. Some days I forget that. Things were fine until one day she snapped and the explosive anger I was all too familiar with was back. The scared child in me retreated, retreated and I, I couldn't lose myself in her storm as I was wavering in my own. I am inherently non-confrontational and at the time of COVID, I was in a constant state of anxiety and anger. Memories of when I was young return, whispers of my sister telling me, you're the problem in mom and dad's marriage made me twitch. To ease these feelings, I used the camera as a meditative process and would go on long walks by myself in the bush. I'm returning to what brought me joy when I was young, when experiencing moments of turbulence. The way the light kissed the earth ever so softly captivated my focus. Walking provided a sense of purpose, a goal, and often clarity, until it didn't. I've always struggled with my mental health. It's something that can be tied to my learning disabilities as well as my unstable childhood. People with learning disabilities are more prone to struggling with their mental health, falling back into self-destructive behaviors once again. I was small and who and far from who I had been earlier that year. By the time fall came around, I was back in therapy. By focusing on what I was feeling and the ever-present dance of sunlight, I slowly began to rebuild myself. Natural lighting is incredible and almost impossible to recreate in a controlled environment. It's a sense of freedom that draws me to it. Growing up in an academic system that wasn't made for me created moments of unease and awkwardness in my body. Echoes of snickers and rejection from my peers. I can't even say for sure it was directed at me though. And maybe it's exactly those moments that allow me to appreciate the freedom of natural light, that freedom I craved because I felt so long masking to fit in. My body had become rigid with anger and out of sync with my core. I now long for not power, but acceptance of all I can be. How I see the world manifests into these photographs. It's not just a sunset, sunset. it's a carefully curated photograph that exists because of years of daydreaming. It is the force that I want to be moving through the world with ease. Every photograph represents something that is in that matter. The complexity of human emotions are much more than the language we have to express them. I'm not simply sad. At some point in my life, I was slowly drifting, longing for a breath, but we don't have a singular word to describe that. And that's where the power of the photographic image comes from. There is no such thing as permanence. Things are always in motion. There are external factors that impact our lives every day, altering our path and the way we process the world. When we think of photography, we believe it represents reality. I beg to differ. The choices that go into a photograph demonstrate the relationship between our minds interacting with the outside world, like light, ge geometry, geography, mixed with the artist's personal feelings and the subject matter. Photography is so subjective that it becomes the only way to relay these experiences. It is not a medium of connection, but disconnection. My camera is an extension of myself, how I can relate to you, how I can speak to you now. This time at home provided me with inner strength in a place that I, where I once hadn't been strong. Since then, I have carried that with being mindful that mental health is a journey. There will be good days and there will be bad days. The bad days are fewer and last shorter, a shorter time than they did before. Presenting this series as a book felt the most natural and honest to the images. They operate as a whole, opposed to singular images. My mentor and I joked that I was a writer in a past life, but dyslexic in this one. Having a center, central auditory processing, processing disorder, I've never connected much to music. Often it sounds like white noise and can make me feel agitated. I find rhythm, repetition, and melody through bookmaking. One mile is orchestrated in four distinct sections. Each part has its own rhythm distinct, but moving effortlessly to the next section. The images are stronger as one, intertwined with poetic verses and words that lose meaning outside of the context of the book. The scale and placement of the images were thoroughly planned. There is an intimacy and softness to the photographs, a floating feeling. Having a smaller book was very important. 
My aim was to have the viewer spend time searching through the individual photographs and focus on what they were feeling. The physical placement on the page was a challenge. I considered centering them, centering the images for a while, but it didn't evoke the same feeling I was hoping for. Honestly, it felt boring in context of the imagery. In the summer, I took the bookmaking part-time course at SPAO. One day, we spent time looking at the book design of the Dutch photographer, Reneke Dutra. It was of her series where she photographed teenage boys and girls at the beach. Each photograph was placed towards the top of the image, and every time I looked at the photograph, my eyes went a bit higher, filling me with an uplifting feeling. That realization was a breakthrough. That's what was missing in my book. I ended up placing them below the center. So every time my viewer looked at my images, they were forced to look down. It creates this depressant sensation. People can interpret your work as they wish, but forcing the viewer to interact with your work in subtle physical ways was vital to my work. The year I spent to make my work felt heavy, and I wanted that same experience to happen every time someone interacted with my book. The most difficult part of the book was the design of the cover. I went through some awful design. For a while, I wanted a photograph in the beginning. Picking one that accurately represented my book was impossible. One thing didn't represent one mile, however, a series of things, like maps or clues that were part of something bigger. Repetitions and clusters of small things fascinate me. I love the look of rashes. With that in mind, I decided to use the photograph of my sister's hives as a starting point. Using the paint tool, I counted every spot she had on her body. In that image, I recreated on the cover, which created an appearance of constellations or a map. The unknown fascinates me, being conscious of how much I don't know, the mysteries of the world, the vast range of our own and others' intellects, experiences and existence. Photographing for the book began in March 2020 and ended in August 2021. The first draft of the book was very different than the final edition. Every time I developed a new roll of film, I thought, this is it. This is what pulls it together. This image here was the last one I included. One evening in the summer, I was sitting in my old apartment listening to a book on tape called Severance by Ling Ma. The book is fiction and focuses on a woman who lives through an apocalyptic pandemic. She flips back and forth between past and present, reflecting on her life she navigates the time and space she currently exists in. She talks about growing up Asian American and visiting her extended family before her parents passed away. This made me reflect on my own life and family history. My mom's mother passed away when my mom was 20 from breast cancer. She was ill for seven years. My mom's mother, Ava Kuchna, was born in Slovakia at the time it was Czechoslovakia and her family immigrated to Canada when she was two. I never knew her, nor do I know much about her. I was named after her. People who did know her have told me how much I look like her. People I don't know comment on how I look Eastern European. And it's a part of myself I don't know. Ling Ma's book Severance pointed out my own question of heritage and how I long to know more, but I won't. Which is why I decided to add three scans to my book. One is the back of a photograph with her name, Ava. When my parents named me, they replaced the E with an A. The second was a scan of her swearing in to be a nurse. The themes of religion depicted in the Nightingale resonated with my own question of faith. The final scan is half of her family's passport. My own longing and curiosity of who she was and how that impacts who I am. Knowing that I am a part of her felt important to include. I believe that my thoughts and feelings surrounding Ava Kutschner are the exact reason why my life is how it is. I long for better. I always believe there's something more magical waiting for me and I become forced in the past or the present, but I struggle living, sorry, the past or the future, but I struggle living in the present. I am a romantic. It's my greatest strength and weakness because I never know how it will manifest. Part of One Mile focuses on growing up with depression. For so long, I felt as if I was underwater. As I present this, it's the first time in my life that I felt like I am catching a breath. When I was young, I would dive off or dock straight down. The bottom of the lake sat 13 feet below the surface of the water. I've always loved the feeling of dry, diving into the water. It's transformative and there exists a world on the other side that we can't quite grasp. There's a lingering feeling that I've always, 
that I've always had before submerging myself in the water, knowing that momentarily things will be different until returning to the surface. Swimming down, my lungs slowly tense up and steadily I push and pull myself to reach the bottom. The bottom of the lake is murky. When my hand makes contact with the sand, a small amount of light catches the microscopic particles as they swirl around my arm. Surrounded by darkness, this moment of serenity is my most prominent memory. Returning to the surface takes patience. My heart beats fast, aching for oxygen, pulling myself towards the shining sun above the water's surface. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That was uh, expertly put and, and, and well written, quite, um, quite, quite personal, quite deep. I, I think that really highlights just how much uh, personal emotion and kind of, you know, what we see are the images on the front and, and you kind of give us clues and, and maps like you, you said, but um, it's not until we, we get to listen to some of these things that we really get to a full experience. Uh, I love the idea of what you said about rhythm. Um, holding a book in your hand is a really personal, intimate experience and on the wall, behind me in the show, you get to see the whole book, the whole design, but that sense of rhythm and that sense of scale really does uh, exhibit well, or it shows off a kind of musical quality. But thank you again. Um, uh, Shay, um, you had a bit of a rocky start to your creative process. Tell me about this project. Tell me about some of the conceptual thoughts. Tell me a little bit about your color choices uh, and the final installation with the broken glass. All right, <laughs> so, just a little bit of a backstory to essentially my work and the text piece of um, my show. I essentially went through a trauma um, where my house got destroyed. My mother was in a relationship in five years or so and slowly but surely this man essentially kind of turned into a monster. Um, he was very manipulative. Uh, he was very abusive mentally and verbally towards my mom and then towards the end was towards me. So essentially the love that he had for my mom was just so dangerous that he kind of portrayed that to our home. So this house, I've moved all my life. My parents were separated when I was three so we just kind of jumped from one house to another but this house here was the only one that I ever felt like home to me. So it just meant that much more and he knew that. Um, so essentially what ended up happening is that my mom had enough. Um, it just, it was an on and off relationship. It just didn't work. And it kind of came to a point where it was starting to affect me and my mom like together in our relationship. So she kind of just said, all right, you know, I can't do this anymore. You do need to leave. He kind of took that a little bit too much to heart and essentially, boarded up our whole home, um, stuffed all the vents. He ended up flooding my house, uh, destroying a bunch of stuff that my mom owned, uh, poked holes in the walls so that the water can seep through into you know the hardwood floors to the basement, essentially destroying over $150,000 worth of damage. And the day that it happened, my mom had to essentially break her own window to her door because the police was not allowed to touch the, you know, the house because he potentially could have been in here. Now, at the time I was with my father because she knew something was wrong and obviously my safety for her was priority. So she broke the window, there was glass shattered everywhere in my front yard. And essentially she was trying to reach because she just, she heard the water. All she was hearing was water. It's kind of like a reflection to my print, the blue tones. Um, essentially, I was trying to recreate that moment. Blue tones is also a very depressive color. Um, I was doing some research in terms of correlation between color and emotion. Um, my first series of Welter was full red. Um, this essentially was a representation of what he was doing to my mom and I. It was a lot of anger. <clears throat> it was a lot of manipulation. It was just such a very powerful thing that we can control. Um, so that series kind of started when he was going downhill. <laughs> I didn't know at the time that it was doing that, but after this whole thing happened, I just kind of put the two together and I said, okay, this, this was my trauma journey. So going back to that day, 
Uh, police ended up finding him in the house. Uh, he did hang a noose in my staircase. He didn't do it at the time. Um, but essentially when I came home to my mom because I knew something was wrong, my dad was trying not to tell me. Um, I just had to see her. I've had such a close relationship with her within the past couple of years just because of things on my dad's side. So her safety and her happiness to me is so important. So the day that I went to go see her, um, she was trying to hide, you know, all the damages from me and the news from me just because she knew what could be coming in terms of my emotion and, you know, my anxiety, my everything. So I did see it. I saw everything. <laughs> and this became the start of essentially like my whole journey of panic attacks, of anxiety, of seeing him as a person, even though he's not physically here anymore, I do see his presence around me, which is not something you want to live through. <laughs> so during that whole year, I had to go through so much therapy, um, <clears throat> sleepless nights, I had so much insomnia. It just affected me so badly. And my mom and I had to essentially separate ourselves from a bit um, to deal with our own trauma. To her, it was the guilt. For her, she thought that he essentially killed himself because of her. But, you know, I was trying to tell her that it's his bipolar, it was his inner demons that was coming out. It, it was his fault, not my mom's. For me, I had to deal with the damage of my home. It wasn't so much of him. Of course, you know, I was affected by it, like he would always corner me, he would always tell me it's my fault, he would yell at me, he was an absolute drunk, so he would try to physically scare me, essentially. So for me, it wasn't so much of him, it had to do with my home. I was stuck with the image and I remember in therapy, we just kept coming back to my front door, my front yard and having the glass all over on the floor. So. Those glass pieces, no, they're not from my front door. It was too unsafe for me to use them. And at the time I didn't think I was gonna use them in my exhibition. Um, when it came time to building it, it just kind of took away to like a flight or flight, flight or fight mode. You know, a lot of people when they have trauma and turmoil, they tend to either store it away for 10 plus years and then they decide to come back or they use it and they just go with it. As I was telling, uh, I believe it was Ottawa Current, I just kind of said, sorry for my language, but I said, fuck it. And I just jumped right in it. It was very short notice and I was, you know, absolutely terrified of doing it. But, you know, this is something that even Michael and I bickered during my two years of <laughs> being at SBO is he was always trying to talk about a narrative. There always had to be a narrative into your work. And, you know, we kept fighting and he kept saying like, you know, why don't you just go to um, funeral homes and grab flowers from the dead and scan them? I said, what does that have to do with me? There's nothing that have to do with me. I, yes, I'm being selfish, I am, you know, but I just, I can't force a narrative out if I don't want to do it, if I don't like it. So I essentially dug it deep into myself and I said, okay, you know what? My work is about my emotions. This is how I express how I feel. So this is how I'm going to do it. <laughs> So this project was really about letting everything out into my work. <clears throat> during the red series, it was the fear, it was the anger. During this blue series, the Nell and Blue, this was all about the representation of water, the broken glass, how I felt watching my home almost like decay in front of me, having to live, you know, houses after houses, moving after like over and over again, just to have this house rebuilt so that we can be back in here. And of course, my mom and I, we had the fear of what if we come back here and we can't live the same, or if we see the home differently and we don't feel safe in here anymore. That was always something that we questioned. However, I had such a strong feeling to this house that it was, you know, this was our home. So I just kind of told my mom, I said, you know what, like, Yes, this house has so much damage and has so much trouble and has so much depression in it. This is our time to turn it around. This is our time to move on 
from this experience and make it better. So yes, my house is fine. <laughs> it's a lot better now, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> but we just kind of made it our own even more now because we were able to change what we wanted. So, you know, it's hard to tell people, like when they came up to my show, they said, wow, Shay, like, you know, you've put so much of your trauma into your work. Like you're literally telling people what happened. How does that make you feel? How do you deal with it? And I just said, you know what? I, I want people to look at my work and think if they know someone who's going through abuse in their family, friends, anything that can maybe spark a little something in them saying, this is actually what happens in the world. Don't stay silent because that's what my mom and I did. We essentially looked at my work and we said, hopefully someday someone can look at this and just think, okay, you know what? My friend is actually in trouble. She's been talking to me about it. Maybe I wanna reach out and help her. It was very much an underlining of abuse and you know awareness to it. It was more the factor of this is what happened on this day. But that underlining was so important to me that I want people to look at it and just feel something. I want them to feel the depression feel the anxiety that I was feeling throughout this whole plus one year of journey. And I'm still recovering from it. It's not over, never will be over. And it's gonna be a part of me, unfortunately. But this is where I get to turn around and get to make it my own. And I get to continue this series and just look back at it and say, you know what? Yeah, I actually did go through this journey and I did go through this trauma. Did it make me a better person? Yes. I find that it made me stronger. Um, I could get like handle my emotions whenever I want. I can try and control them whenever I want as before I couldn't. So thanks to that trauma, thanks to the therapy, it's not something that I'm necessarily proud of talking about sometimes, but I do come out as I went through this. I'm alive, I'm here. I get to control what I want now. Thank you so much for sharing, Shay. That's it's it's always um, always astonished at how brave you are and, and continuing to retell the story and continuing to have to revisit these kind of events. And I think the the installation and exhibition really highlights it, it's so beautiful at times, you know, the, the sun hits the glass and shimmers and, and twinkles, you can hear it, and then you have these beautiful flowers, and then and then you also see the danger and you also see the depth of the darkness and you read the story. I think it's an incredible balance of both. Uh, thank you again for for sharing. Um, Steve, um, this project is such an interesting evolution from, from, from your previous work. Tell me more about it. Tell me about uh, your partnerships. Uh, tell me about putting your, your own face forward. Um, let, tell, me, tell me all about uh, your work. Uh, sure, and uh, hello to everyone. Darren, I'm going to share my screen, um, which I think hopefully will answer some of the questions that uh, you posed around my journey um so perfect okay um so th this is a this is actually a journey this is um in fact i would say it's it's this journey that even led me to to come to spout and become a full-time student and th do the diploma because as i embarked upon this work that i uh, will uh, uh reveal um, you know, I, at the time, I didn't have the photographic uh, capacity and experience and uh, capabilities to do the work. So that's pretty much why I came to Spout was to do this this piece of work in in a way that uh, would allow me to share it uh, publicly um, and professionally, so to speak. So um, the the work in the show is called Beyond the Mask and mind and the title keeps changing a little bit but but effectively as we'll see this this is a um a reflection of how we as as individuals and people wear our masks every day around and to sometimes cover our feelings or change our feelings or represent our feelings and so we're always wearing a mask and and that's what this work is 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 about but um you know, it started, you know, as I said, as a journey to evolve my artistic, the artistic side of me. I'm actually, uh, my background is in science. 
and in health sciences. And a large part of that is actually molecular and uh, health uh, imaging. So I see the work that, that I'm doing as a combination of arts and science. Um, and, you know, a lot of people in the arts forget that science is also an imaginative experience, just like the arts. And it requires, you know, knowledge and reason that aren't separated from feelings. And, and you know, science isn't just numbers or data. It, it actually is experiential. And so as part of this work, I am exploring a little bit the interconnectivity between art, technology, science, and, and engineering. And so um, the work is fundamentally premised on taking uh, brain scans, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, and understanding what we can do with those brain scans and talk more about sensory perception, talk more about you know, the importance of imaging in health, the importance of images in our society. And, you know, notwithstanding that photography itself is a blend of art and science in visual technology and engineering. Um, and imaging, as I said, is very critical in health sciences, well, starting all the way back to the x-ray. But, you know, today, if, if you need to get something diagnosed, very often you end up, you know, with an x-ray, a CT scan or an MRI. So it is very much now part of, part of our health except that it has not been used in mental health until more recently. So, so molecular imaging or functional imaging um, is relatively new in terms of research, uh, diagnostics, and then maybe therapy and mental health. So this whole project is about mental health. Um, and of course, during the pandemic, there's been a, a recognition of how critical mental health is and in fact um, people forget that mental health and physical health are completely intertwined they're not separate and people talk about them separately so part of my work is to try and create conversations discussions reduce the the role of stigma around mental health because mental health obviously affects how we act how we feel how we relate to our environment, to other people, how we make choices. And, and unfortunately, in mental health, one of the biggest barriers to progress is stigma. And, you know, prejudgment or being judgmental. And stigma is a huge issue around awareness and recovery in dealing with mental health issues. So, so the work really is centered around that. Um, and it is a reflection on mental health. And so diving a little more deeply, um, because um, I have this amazing access to brain scanning, um, it made me think about the brain, the neurobiology, the neurochemistry, the emotional aspects of the brain, how, how we all use our brains in different ways such that when we look at an image, a photograph, we actually will all see it somewhat differently because our visualization, a lot of it is based upon our memories and what's inside our brains that we've experienced previously. So, you know, trying to create this intersection, visual art, so sort of science, medical discovery, then our consciousness and our state of being. Um, and the brain is, you know, the sort of the most complex but the most unknown of, of, of our bodies. I mean, it's what we, do, as everybody knows, there are more neurons and interconnections in our brain than there are kind of molecules in the universe. I mean, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal, you know, sort of three pound piece of um, evolution. And only now we're beginning to understand um, how the brain works. We know about its structure, but how it actually works we, we use very little, we have very little knowledge. Um, so this work, um, as we dive into it, um, is, is I, I like to think that it is innovative and it's new and it's different because um, I'm taking data from an MRI machine 
which is effectively bits and bytes, it's computer generated data. And then I reframe the data using a variety of um, medical imaging software called DICOM software. And then I combine um, what Tardioli taught me uh, about Photoshop, <laughs> plus all the YouTubes on Photoshop, blah, 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 to then create, you know, some, some unique imagery. And, and as you do this, then, you know, I'm thinking about my own emotional fragility and my expressions, my dreams and who, you know, what is my inner self and um, how, how do I represent myself and how do I think about myself? So, so this has certainly challenged me in terms of my own persona. Um, and um, just to say that this work, because of its mental health, you know, um, uh, connections will be permanently displayed at the Royal Hospital here in Ottawa and is being used by the Royal in its sort of advocacy. So a little bit of a dive into how we get there. So on the right, uh, I think it's on the right of my screen, is the actual machine itself. And it's not a standard MRI machine. It's the only machine in Canada that's used for mental health research here in Ottawa. And it's called a PET fMRI machine. And on the left, these are the images that you actually get from the scan. So these would be the medical images that will be used for research or diagnostics or understanding um, about the brain. Um, they look like kind of x-rays and, and that's what I, the data that I get represents that. So that's what I start with. Um, but I was able to say, use the software and um, the machine is at the Royal, the Institute of Mental Health Research. And as we always talk about things in photography access, I have access to the machine. And even, and so you'll see now um, my brain scans and they are my brains that you'll be seeing. But the first part of this story was about creating a book that was about stigma and substance use disorder. Um, the book was called Beautiful, whoops. The book was called Beautiful Minds. And these are some of the images from the book. The book contained portraits of people with lived experience and their stories. And there was a little bit of kind of factoids in there about neurobiology. Um, and these are two examples of the work from the book that were on public display at Lansdowne this summer. Um, you know, they're kind of Andy Warholish, pop artish. Um, but these are brains. And so these are brain images, not my brain actually. Um, they were a subject in a clinical trial, but these images were created using the various software and uh, photographic techniques. So the new work that's on display is much more personalized. Oops. Um, and, and so the images that follow this um, in the show are of my brain. And I wanted to capture my feelings. And then some of the images actually are images around different thought processes while in the machine. And so this is all about understanding our memory, our consciousness, and, and the way that we see the world and the way the world sees us. So this is a self-portrait. Um, it looks a bit scary. I don't think any of my pieces of work are the sort of thing that you want to put on your mantelpiece above the fire. Um, they're quite challenging. Um, it look, this may look like I've got some sort of Ebola type disease, but actually what this particular image is, um, is a composite of, of my self-portrait with something called a Rorschach, which is a psychological test, a behavioral test. And it's basically the ink block test. Some people may have heard of that. So that, that is actually the ink block sort of crammed together. I actually used inkjet ink. I created an inkjet, created it, and, and, then, and then put it behind because that's how we feel. We, we don't have a consistent feel. There's all kinds of stuff going on in our minds at any one period of time. So that's kind of what I wanted to express uh, with this image. And then this image, um, again, is a self-portrait, but it's 360 degrees. And when the machine takes your, your brain scans and it can scan you in different planes, it can scan you kind of this way, this way, or that way, it takes slices. So here there are 34 slices. The machine takes 34 to 256 slices to create the photographs that you saw earlier. And the data at the top of the bottom and behind the image actually is my brain data. So this is actually the 
um, the data that is embedded in the machine and then the software creates the photograph from that data. So that that's kind of, and so it's a, a literally a slice of my portrait, very similar to what the machine uh, does. This is where we get to the mask and it gets a little Halloween-ish, I, I know. And this is interesting because if you look at this image, you'll see that if this, these are a series of slices from the front all the way through to the back. Um, and, you know, this, this, this image I've created with the software because it truly is an Aztec kind of mask that, you know, we wear our masks. And this is the definition of the kind of mask that I was wearing when my brain was being scanned. The next image, um, you know, is, you know, it's a bit like Han Solo and Star Wars, you know, Jabba the Hutt encapsulating him in ice a little bit. This is a death mask. And this is an image that I kind of came across using the software that I had never seen before. And if you are in the studio and look at the image, um, you'll see that, um, the image actually looks maybe a bit like a painting because it's been lacquered. So I printed the image and then I hand lacquered the image. It has many, many coats of lacquer on it to give it a texture. And, I, and anybody can go up and they can touch the image and you know it's, it's, um, it's, it's fully lacquered. And so the expression here, I think is one of tranquility. And again, you know, our mask and tranquility, but getting behind the skin, this is very, so look, looks, the skin here is in the nose in particular have been deconstructed. So another mask in our imagery. This one here is, is a little different. It's a little more psychedelic, um, but again, it's a representation of actually the emotions in the brain because the color part of this is actually tracking the brain activity. And then the, the actual, and, then, and that is my brain um, that I was able to recompose um, uh, from the data that I had. So my brain looks like that. Um, and then it's superimposed on top of the activity of the brain. And then finally, um, again, I kind of came across a methodology to create movement in the imagery. So, um, the original image here would have been black and white. It would have been a series of slices from the top of the head. So that's sort of in this, this plane. And I was able to create this sort of warp, <laughs> warp speed kind of imagery because our brains are thinking at warp speed all the time. And, our, and the amount of movement of water and neurotransmitters in the brain is so fast and we don't understand it. So this image to me kind of captured the fact that um, we may look static and we may be wearing a static mask, but boy, going on behind that mask, there's, there's billions and billions of, of neurons uh, firing in different directions. So anyway, thank you for, for the opportunity to present the work. Um, you can look at my website. It is available on the Royals uh, website pages and uh, and so forth. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much for sharing. It. Um, I find the as 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 humans, as photographers, we're we're very trained on faces, and we're always kind of looking at everything surface value. And I find the work in the exhibition really highlights exactly what you're saying: is that it's it's the face, the skin is just the mask, and everything underneath is so alien and unknowable. And we're just starting to really dive into that kind of science and art and being able to imagine what that could even look like. So uh, I found that exactly what you're saying: it, it really highlights this kind of idea of surface level versus kind of interior level. Um, I want to open up. I've got a couple questions uh, for the panel, and then we have got some questions coming in from uh, the audience as well that I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, any, just for everybody there, if you want to add some questions to the chat, I'll, I'll read them out as we go. But um, we've all talked a bit about how this project affected you as a person. We all talked about personal jury, journeys. Has this exhibition allowed a kind of finality or allowed a kind of maybe release or, or personal discovery in some way? Does the act of hanging it on the wall or the act of installing or the act of talking about it in an artistic context allowed a kind of um, 
kind of milestone marker in your journey. Um, maybe we can talk more open and I'll start with Ava if you have uh, any thoughts on, on that. Uh, on like the process of like installation then? Yeah, does, 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 so you, you've gone through the journey, you've had a bit, you've, you've completed a work, you have a book, you have the installation, does that add a bit of release? Does it feel like uh, this journey is now complete or does it feel just like a milestone in your journey or does it feel like um, this is just another part of the, the story, the telling of it? Yeah, so I see, um, as I mentioned, I did uh, The Moss at Home, and then I did Romantics and now I have One Mile and I've actually just started. So I see them as chapters. And so mm -hmm. I've started my next chapter and it, you know, I work on other things, but there is something, I think One Mile was the first time that I kind of went all in. Like I designed my cover, I had a forward, I kind of went through all the steps and, um, yeah, it was definitely a turning point when I decided to put the book on the wall because that was very nerve wracking and very untraditional from, I'm very much like, I want four images on the wall that best represent my work. And so putting it on the wall and destroying a book was a whole lot of levels that I don't, I don't love, but I can let go of control. Um, but yeah, so, it's definitely a small segment on a journey. And I like this idea that it's a chapter. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great way to describe it, especially someone who's very book focused in their practice. I think that it's an yeah. interesting way to describe that. Steve, what about you? Do you find this is um, this allowed to kind of next chapter moment or do you feel like we're still kind of diving into this is just the tip of the surface uh, in your kind of exploration? Well, I'm on the same page as Ava. Um, <laughs> it's a chapter. Yep. Um, I, it is. I mean, I think the whole artist in residence experience itself leading up to the exhibition um, kind of it, it's a transitionary experience. Uh, certainly for me anyway, transitioning from being a, a diploma student to being um, comfortable and confident that you can call yourself an artist. And I, and, I, and I don't know where the, you know, where the line is in that, Darren, where you, you know, one minute you're, you're, you're kind of wannabe and then you are an actual be, but, but um, plus, plus the fact that you're, ex you know, you have to get the work done. <laughs> you have a deadline, you sign a contract, um, you know, you, you, you are way more invested, I think, in this exhibition of work than you're invested in doing the end of year show at the end of the two year diploma, I, th I think. I mean, you know, you're out there, you're being judged, uh, you're judging yourself for sure and dealing with all the issues around that. Um, and then, you know, you kind of burst through the, through the, the, the door and you've arrived. And, and, and I think for me, the most important aspect of this is, this is my work, a little bit like what Shay was talking about. Um, it's not that I don't care what people think, but I'm not driven by what people think. It's my work, you may like it, you may hate it, you may think it's rubbish, you may think it's the most brilliant thing ever done, like Damien Hurst, but probably none of those, but it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter. And, and it will continue. So the good thing is, you know, this has allowed me to continue to, to say that I am an artist and I'm going to continue with my practice. Yeah, that's, that's really well said. Um, Margot, what do you think about that? Does this, do you feel like you've, you've reached a kind of another level in your practice um, with this exhibition, this kind of incubation period over COVID? Do you feel like you've kind of hit some, some new kind of self-confidence with this with this work absolutely and i agree with steve that the artist in residence program actually it, it is a re well it was a really important step for me to just have one more year of well it was six to eight months of of sort of professional support to help me figure out where i was going as a as an artist 
And also I agree with Steve that I've reached a point because of this, because of being an artist in residence, but also with this project that I, I'm much more confident about my ability to start and finish a project and then turn it into a book because I've also done a, another book since then. Um, that's a whole different process and a lot more complicated than I ever anticipated. So yes, I feel that I've reached a new stage. I do care obviously what think people think of it, but it's not gonna change how I do my work. It's, it's sort of an exterior, um, sort of an exterior chapter to what I'm doing, people's opinions. Um, but generally I, I've sort of managed to sort of um, crystallize my approach and what interests me as a, as a photographer. I think that's really what this project did. And and Shay, what do you, what do you how are you feeling? This do you find the the images hard to look at? Is this the, a knee jerk reaction to an immediacy, or do you find this is kind of a uh, a next page moment for you? How do you feel this installation of exhibition has kind of marked your your journey? Uh, kind of both in a way. I will admit that the first time that it was fully complete, I had the text, I had the glass and the image. It it did go to heart. <laughs> I was trying not to cry, <laughs> but it also is also like another chapter. Um, I will be closing off this series with another color represented, like representing healing and just being in my own self happiness and just having to finish therapy and having to close that chapter off. I will continue scanning, but it just that part will be done. So yes looking at uh, like on it at the wall it just it felt super surreal <laughs> and i was like you know this this is my work like i steve was saying that you know you you start to feel this confidence because like i've always been not been confident with my work i've always doubt myself and doubt my work and every single time i look at it and i said is it enough like do i need to push it more do i need to it always has to be more but there has to be a point in your work where you just say okay, this is it, show it off. Because your work is your work. Nobody else can take that away from you. So be very proud of what you do. These are on your hands. Like you craft everything that you do. Nobody's ever gonna copy it the same way that you can. So just put it out there, honestly, and just be proud of it. Because if you just keep doubting yourself and keep pushing that feeling back, you just won't ever feel satisfied to a point. You'll always be like, okay, well, now I got to go do another work. And you just start to regress the passion of art. So that, you know, you just, you have to start accepting it, that your work is perfect. <laughs> We've talked a lot about um, a lot of kind of our, our personal journeys, our personal development. And aesthetically, I find the work quite dark in the exhibition. I find there's, there's actually quite a bit of cohesion. Um, considering we're all in COVID, we're all kind of working on our individual projects. Can you tell me a little bit about, um, do you find that this is uh, a, not, I find it a very timely exhibition, but do you find that it go, can go beyond personal journey? You know, this is, yes, this is my personal journey, but do you find the work can also reflect current day topics? Do you find that, um, you're hitting a wider range of, of, of conversation. Are you hearing other artists talk about this kind of thing? I guess I'm curious to know if you see your work in this show or what you're working on now uh, in line with kind of wider reaching topics that are really relevant today. Um, Steve, maybe I'll start with you. Sure, um, and I think uh, for me, absolutely. Um, the whole ethos concept behind the work was to create uh, a series of conversations. Um, the book was about stigma, <clears throat> substance use disorders. Um, my work, you know, um, this particular work, I do other stuff too, by the way, that's not as dark. Um, <laughs> but, um, this particular work is designed to open up the conversations around mental health, and stigma, and the importance of research and science in, in understanding and dealing with mental health. So, so for me, it, it, it has to create an audience and discussion and, 
and that's really what my goal is in this work. Margot, why don't you uh, kind of follow on that? You know, when I think about COVID, I think about how I kind of um, relegated myself to my specifically local community. And I, and I wonder if your work talks a little bit about how some of these kind of, um, your project kind of talks a little bit about the, about the conversation of, of the importance of our, our neighborhoods, if that makes sense. Well, I think that's what it's it's really about is is a neighborhood being all in in this particular project sort of a very small microcosm. It's the size of the rink and the pro the you know the park around and how people relate to it. But the images also when I was shooting this the project, well, I told people obviously what I was doing, and they would they would say almost without exception how important it was that they had this place to go. They said it was the only place they could go and have fun in the winter. So those rinks were not just a place where people skate and, you know, play hockey. Um, they were a place where they could escape from the confines of, of COVID, even though there were restrictions on the number of people on the rinks. And for a long time, they couldn't play hockey, although people did, I have to be honest. Um, it was really, they represented sort of the, not only a little you know, like this little warm circle of light in the at night, it also represented an escape from what people were living in their homes. And so I, I found that when I had people say that to me, I felt it was really important uh, to show these, these places because it had a, a, a wider appeal, it had a wider meaning for people in the community. So yeah, it was, uh, and you know, I, I another thing I wanted to say very briefly is that, uh, People came to when people came to the show at Spau and looked at the rinks. I found people getting very emotional about them, and I was surprised by that. Maybe I'm tired of looking at them. I don't know, but um, no. But especially men, men would get very emotional. I think it reminded them of their childhood, of things they did when they were younger, uh, maybe of happier times. So I thought that was kind of that was a big surprise for me. Yeah, I know. I know some of my favorite memories are the 6 a.m. kind of rink smell. There's like a icy, concretey smell that is ingrained. So I can, I can <laughs> definitely see how that could come out when you look at the work. Um, Shay, same, same question. Um, we've talked a lot about personal journeys and you kind of brought it up a little bit when you're talking about how, how do you hope this kind of reflects or how, how do you hope people can kind of take on, uh, see your work and kind of take on some wider topics and wider themes? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like technically, like I was saying when I was talking, I had an underlining uh, subject of abuse and awareness. Like technically, I wanted the forefront to be about my um, trauma. That really was the show to let me just release it to the world. But I could change the project a little bit, change the wording and make it go to more uh, abuse. Uh, I could definitely reach out to, you know, um, people who had abuse or are dealing with it right now, that you can always change the project a little bit how you want it to be. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think that it could be a definitely a wider range of audience that could be reached out to. Um, it just depends on if I want to do it or not, if I'm ready to do it. Um, I think a person has to deal with their own trauma first and healing first before having to reach to other people to help them out. Thank you. And, and Ava, what do you think? Um, can, can some of the themes in your, in your book and your, your kind of more diary practice or this kind of practice of those experience, do you think that reaches a, a kind of wider contextual context in, in this kind of confined COVID pandemic world events type uh, situation? Yeah, so a very selfish thing is that I loved COVID because growing up with depression, everyone started to experience those same feelings. Um, and I think because my goal in my work is to create imagery that evokes a feeling, um, very, I'm very aware of lighting and shadows and they're very, um, yeah, a lot of feeling oriented work. And I do think that, uh, people connect with that and whether they know why they do or don't. Um, 
Yeah, I I think especially with my work, it may be a little more difficult for people to connect because unless it's what I see is that it's I present the work and if you can't get there emotionally, like like you have to bring something to it. I'm not gonna hold your hand the whole way. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's, I think, mm, yeah, part of my mandate and work is um, it's, it's a give and take. Like it's not all the way there. And you also have to be willing to dig within yourself to, yeah, feel what you're feeling. And a lot of people want to know what it's about, but that's, I don't think, what art is about. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we've got some questions from the audience that I uh, would like to, to ask you. Um, there's some individual ones. So, uh, Ava, it's, uh, it sounded like uh, your book started kind of your final year or once you finished, uh, once, once you graduated. Um, how did you manage delivery uh, without compromising? Like, how did you kind of know that it was due or how did you have how did you because your emotional process and your emotional journey journey does not usually fall in with the date that I give you for the exhibition right so how do you kind of navigate between whether it's it's done so to speak or and and, and the exhibition date where you have to have been for install and you have to have been for for this how do you kind of navigate you know a, a deadline with this with this kind of personal emotional journey yeah so I have been very spoiled with the mentors that that I've had. Um, so Tony Foos was one of my mentors and he said to me, you got, you got to end it at some point. And it's, it's true. It, yes, I did have these deadlines. I did take the bookmaking course because I just, I work very good in those kind of settings. I needed the flex type, but, and so the book was like 90% done. And then it was just a little, of my own soul searching on the way, but part of it was that photograph of my brother. That just, as soon it was, as it was there, it just really, really made me realize that there was like this flow and there was a lot of sequencing and stuff like that. But I also found this song and I ended up formatting my book to the song. So yeah, there was four distinct parts and you do have to give yourself these deadlines but I also like I have some projects that I've worked five years on I have some projects that and the next project that I've started my deadline is kind of around two years so enough time to kind of go through some stuff and yeah it's but it the writing and the the work it took a long time and I'm still discovering what it's about and another uh, a friend of mine, Bill Stobby, had said to me once, um, sometimes you don't know what your work is about till years later. And I think that's really, really important to think about. Um, and I just think that if we don't, the world expects a lot of deadlines. And at some point, yes, something has to end. But we can also revisit works with a different lens. And so I'm always updating what my work is about because the further you get from it, sometimes it gives you a clearer of idea, idea of what it's about when you're not so intertwined with your emotions and what you're experiencing. And you can, it gives you a little bit of clarity. Um, and I feel like the longer I look at my work and the longer I sit with it, um, I have a better idea of what's, what it's about because my work is very reflective, um, even though I'm not like, you know, a perfect person. But yeah, okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, another question, Margo, um, you kind of approached this so like almost like an anthropologist or an ethnographer, like you kind of approached this and you kind of like integrated yourself into the city and the, the, all these different neighborhood communities. How did you start that collaboration with the city of Ottawa? Was it a cold call? Was it like, hey, I want to make a book. Are you interested? Or was it more like, hey, I'm looking at doing this thing. Like, like tell me a little bit about that process of, of collaboration and slowly kind of integrating and, and photographing. Well, uh, actually, uh, it was my background as a journalist that was hugely helpful. Um, I used to be a reporter for CBC and 
Um, over the years, I had done a number of stories. I was an environmental reporter. I had done the stories on climate change and how they were affect how it was affecting rinks in the city of Ottawa. And I actually met the guy who was in charge of rinks in the city. Say a different person from the one I dealt with, but I knew that there was a Mr. Rink at the city that I could call. So I phoned the new Mr. Rink, Paul Dupuy, and um, and I knew that they would have a list of all the all the uh, the rinks. In fact, there is a list online. Um, so that was extremely helpful. I sort of knew how to start the, the project. It was a cold call, but uh, I'm used to cold calls. Didn't bother me, and it's sometimes it's the only way you can get anything started. Um, and from there, all he said was, "That's a really interesting project. You should stay in touch. We should stay in touch." And so it kind of evolved from there. Um, and as the project went on, I would talk to him, ask him questions, send him some of the photos. And, and then he said, you know, we'd be interested in buying your, your book. Um, so that's kind of where it went from there. And I'm lucky that, that the guy who was in charge of rinks in the city was so engaged in, in, in the project. But it was, it was really just picking up the phone, sending some emails. I actually did call some other groups in the city. One of them in particular was a Learn to Skate uh, program, which, oh, I think that would have been amazing uh, visually. Um, a lot of the kids are new to Canada, and I thought that would be very interesting, but they didn't have it last year. It was, it was, they did, but it was really, really small, and they didn't want any extra people because of COVID. So that restricted um, my ability to shoot that. But just one other thing, um, which is kind of a sh uh, an example of how if you start something, it can lead to something else. I went to shoot a um, a rink near Orleans in Eastvale. And uh, it's a small community sort of just west of Orleans, an older community. And the rink didn't look very promising in the fall, but I had written a note saying might be better in the winter. So I went back and I went back a night that uh, somebody was cleaning the rink uh, late at night. It was a teacher from a nearby uh, middle school. And uh, she said, oh, you should come back during the day. We have gym classes on the rink. And she said, here's my colleague, he'll just email him and let him know if you ask him if he can come. And I did, and he, I went back three times just to take shots of the uh, gym classes. Again, most of the kids were new to Canada and were using um, chairs to help them skate. It was a wonderful thing. And it was simply a case of following through on a gut feeling that maybe something would work and following up on that initial kind of really a cold meeting in, in a rink. So you have to just, keep at it and just follow your gut and, you know, follow up leads and uh, just talk to everyone you can. Yeah, I think that's, that's so relevant, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not about taking an image and then leaving. It's about taking an image and then following up. Here's what the image looks like. Hey, and then and talking to that person and kind of keeping people invested. Um, a lot of people think that just like, sending out an email blast means that you have a followership, you know, um, but it, it is actually about kind of more communication than that. And I think, I think you do a really uh, good job. And I think that that shows when, when you have a citywide kind of like interest in your, in your, in your work. Um, there's a question here for Shay. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo, where did it go? Can you talk about the transition um, from graduation to making this work? I think, I think the idea is emotionally, but also maybe like as a um, younger person and someone who's displaced, how, how hard is it to like get your studio going, deal with, get some finances and like how hard is that kind of transition from graduation to here we are now uh, alongside the kind of emotional journey you've gone through? Um, I will admit that after I graduated SPAO that I was not ready to go uh, because going from high school I went directly to Algonquin, like the photography programs. I did two years of that. And then I went directly to SPAO. So I've done school pretty much all my life. And it was just all in one go. Um, so having to graduate from that program, I just wasn't ready. And I, I personally needed a little bit more help and <clears throat> more support on like what to do after. Because like I am motivated to a certain point, but I do need someone to just kind of push me up and help me out. Um, so it was a little bit tough, not going to lie. Um, I was working part-time, uh, going to school. I will say at the start, when you're not financially stable, it will be tough to want to do your work because you kind of need money to come in. <laughs> yeah. Cause like I've luckily, um, 
Whitney Lewis Smith gave me most of her collection of her dried flowers. So that helped me out so, so much. So if you have the connections, use them. Uh, luckily she was giving them away because she was moving to Mexico. So it just kind of lined up perfectly with it. Um, I'm slowly starting to buy my own collection, um, but work right now is a little bit more priority just because I need that money to come in, unfortunately. So it is a hard transition, not gonna lie. Um, you know, when you have the chance to scan, you take it, but you just kind of have to flow with your life. Unfortunately, it's not something that you can prioritize unless you can. So it was a hard lesson to learn. I'm still learning it. <laughs> um, you will lose some of the passion sometimes, but you just have to push yourself to do it. But honestly, if you really love your work and you really like doing it, it'll just, it'll take its time. You don't need to be an artist right then and there, like Steve said, you know, you know, I want to be to an actual be. You don't need to be that person right then and there. It will take time. So just flow with it. So true. It's so true. Yeah. Um, this is the last question. This is uh, at Steve, but I'm going to open it up to everybody. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your installation choice and 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 what you printed on and why you printed on it and um, or, or, or what have you. Can you tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, um, some of your decision-making in, in the installation printing and things? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, <clears throat> uh, so I printed all my images um, and then two of them I felt needed to be bigger than the, the printer that, that I have. So I went and, you know, had them done in a, in a print shop. Um, the choice of the imagery was really try to sort of try and represent the body of work. I mean, so, uh, the, you know, I had quite a few different images to choose. Um, one of the things that I struggled with in making the choice was sort of the consistency and because the images are all quite different. So they cover, you know, the landscape of the work Whereas I could have chosen one particular type of image and then sort of evolved through different iterations of that particular style. So I made, I'm, I made a conscious choice to um, sort of show the different elements rather than focusing on one particular thematic. Um, and then um, some of the images like the one behind me um, and the ones that are upstairs in, in, in Spout, are printed on a metallic paper because that just gives it the pop. And so I discovered that at the um, end of year, uh, you know, diploma show, that printing on metallic gave it a certain visual feel. And then I, you know, made a conscious choice, as I mentioned earlier, on to take the um, one of the images and um, hand lacquer it to give it much more of a sort of a textual feel because it is, a, you know, that image of the sort of, you know, the uh, where the nose is flaking away and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of texture in that. So that I think deserved being even more textualized rather than printing it on canvas or something like that that looks fake. I actually have developed a technique for um, um, lacquering uh, the imagery uh, with Japanese lacquers, hand lacquered. And so that's how I kind of arrived at where we were. And then you, Darren, decided which ones to put in the uh, on the ground floor and which ones to put upstairs. <laughs> yes, and and your work is different too because we've split it up almost. Uh, so when you brought your work in, uh, I there was quite a bit of curatorial decision. There's a lot of back and forth. I put them in every single um, place on the wall that I could, and I wanted to really match this idea of, of masks. A present that idea first. Uh, and then also this kind of uh, alienation and this kind of thing. So um, the decision to put the three kind of more face or mask pieces on one wall and then the, the face that's kind of jumbled on another highlights this kind of duality or, or I felt like it highlighted this duality between kind of um, representation and, and kind of medical bits and bobs that kind of you have to deal with and kind of it comes in, like you said, it comes in slices. Uh, the other thing too is that it, it it paired so beautifully with Shay's glass and, and floral imagery for some reason it felt like fragmentation it felt like a, a personality that's that's in split and I find that the two works right. um, echo each other in really interesting ways uh, so that's that's how that kind of got split uh, a little bit and then the two works upstairs um, 
that was, yeah, that was a, a bit of aesthetic kind of curatorial choice. Um, I want to open up. Um, uh, Margot, did you have any thoughts on installation? It, it, we had a, you were going to do a, a big, big, big piece, and, and now we have six. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Oops. You're muted. One sec. Um, the book that I was uh, that I produced had three chapters. The first uh, thirty pages were. Um, images of the rinks. So all of the portraits of the rinks were at the beginning. And then there were two other chapters, one of the work that was done and of the people who used the rinks. So I played around with the idea of having a, a mixture of people and rinks together. But really in the end, uh, it was all, it was decided and I agreed with it that, that the best shots were of the rinks and that having them as a, just on their own would be the best way of showing and, and playing with the idea of, of loneliness and winter and isolation and community all in one, on one spot in the wall. So that's why we decided to choose just the ranks, not the people. Um, also, I, I had them mounted. I didn't use a frame. I'm sick of the look of frames, honestly. <laughs> and also I wanted to just have a clean line, no, nothing else to distract from, from the images of the rinks. And that was my, my choice. And I, I actually am happy with, with the result of not using uh, glass and frame or even just a frame, just, just having them mounted the way they are. So, um, and the choice of the images themselves, uh, I had two that I knew that I wanted definitely in the show. And then I chose the others just to complement those. Ava, uh, your installation, I, now I will say with Ava, we, you and I went back and forth. There was going to be a video component at one point. There was going to be different kind of iterations. Tell me how you kind of finally landed on this one. Um, okay. Uh, making a book is a lot of work. Um, I think the final page count was with, with covers and everything was 102 pages. And I just, so at my, at the, uh, like our 2020 diploma exhibition, I had um, four books and a lot of people didn't take the time to look through those books, which like I get, but also it was a lot of work. And I decided that I put a lot of, lot of love, a lot of labor into these books. And I, that's what, was important for people to interact with and to see. And it turned into this really interesting, I think you had said it, Darren, like it, somebody had said to me, it looks like a constellation. I felt, and I think it was you. And while I didn't notice that at first, it ties in very nicely. And also once it was up in on the wall, there was definitely this rhythm to it which also reminded me of like the contact photos that I made, but yeah, it went through a lot of variations. And a part of that was that I changed during the period that I made this. And I wanted my work to be reflective of who I am now versus who I was eight months ago. But yeah, so I'm happy with it. Yeah. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, and Shay, um, you have a single image. So there's a lot of imagery in the exhibition and you chose to put just a single one. Tell me a little bit about that, that uh, choice. Um, so previously in my grad show, I did have two large 30 by 40 prints um, that were just a whole series of my scans. I also had a, um, a box with just prints with it. So I thought again, like, should I, copy the same thing or the same concept idea. And I just said, I think personally, it would make more of an impact if it was just one image alone, just kind of have that self reflection of, I was alone during this process, or I felt alone during this process of healing um, and going through this trauma that I thought that maybe one piece could just have someone look at it and just sink in it. Um, I also, I'm very much of a, not a 3D, type of person, but I like structure and I like building something out of the print. Um, I've always been someone like that. Like in my grad show again, I had flowers dangling from my box. It looked like it was floating and coming out of it. 
So I've always been someone to integrate something a little bit more 3D to my print. Um, so I was kind of like building it and thank you for one of the first years to helping me with that. But we were building in, my original idea was having the glass go all the way to the bottom to represent the glass from the floor. But then as I was trying to make it, the strings were kind of being a little, like they were obstructing the view of the print itself. So I kind of just thought, start from the top, we'll see where it goes from there. And it kind of ended up going great because you kind of have to like walk into the glass to see the print up close. So having that like um, interaction was fantastic. I really liked it. Um, Darren was also saying that it kind of represents rain a little bit. It's rain is very much a depression. It's very sad, it's very heavy. Um, so I thought that complemented it very well as well as when it's very, very sunny out the reflection of the glass goes onto the print and it kind of just shadows it onto it as well. So that is a little representation also of um, that heaviness that I really liked. Thank you. Uh, and thank you uh, to all four of our panelists. Um, if you want to follow along, you can uh, visit their websites or, or their Instagram, which is all uh, listed uh, on the digital exhibition, which you can visit uh, the link that'll follow this announcement. Again, thank you to everybody. Thank you for sharing. Thanks to the audience for being here. Um, the exhibition will be on until just about the end of December um, and you can catch them as they continue doing their work uh, and follow along. Uh, thank you again.